next episode of our Somerset Stories uh, series with uh, catching up with a few players from, from yesteryear with a few memories of their time with us at, uh, at, in Taunton. But I'm delighted to welcome from uh, all the way from Perth, Australia, another former captain of, of Somerset, now coach of Australia, Justin Langer. Lovely to see you, Justin. Hello, Parso. It's nice to see you too, mate. It's very nice to see you. But, so how's life down in Perth, mate? All good? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, I say this with great um, uh, compassion and respect, but this isolation period has been incredible. We've had amazing weather. It's uh, autumn here. We're just coming into our winter. The weather in Perth is incredible. I see my kids every day have home-cooked meals instead of Uber Eats. Yeah, no, I think lockdown's been uh, been nice for those of us that have been able to enjoy it, but um, obviously it's tough times for, for some around the world. How are things over there at the moment? Are they sort of releasing the uh, lockdown pressures? Oh, it has been. In, in, in We've been incredibly lucky, Paso, in, in Australia. Um, I know New Zealand, our closest neighbours, they're almost back to completely normal. They've got zero cases in their country at the moment. We've had very few. In Western Australia, we've had very few cases. So we're very, very lucky. Um, at field, we still have the, some of the similar rules, but certainly it's been relaxed enormously. Uh, rugby league's back up and running. Rugby... Um, uh, and AFL starts this week. Uh, at the moment, it's still played in front of no crowds and we still have restrictions on interstate travel. But overall, we've been incredibly lucky. When I see what's happening, you know, and even in England, I've obviously got so many close friends in your beautiful country to see how it's affected uh, you guys. It's been, it's been heart-wrenching really, but here we've been, we've been very lucky. Yeah, I think we've been quite lucky down in the Southwest as well, I think. Ben, ben was saying earlier on that there's a few cricketers out on the field again at the moment training. So hopefully we're coming through the worst and, you know, we're fingers crossed we might get some cricket by the end of the year. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been tough. Anyway, I think the Somerset members will be pretty patient with us if we start a little bit on your Aussie career, mate. I mean, you had a massive, massive career for Australia spanning a number of years. Um, obviously, great times that you look back with, with fond memories. Oh, yeah, it was incredible. Uh, and it, I think one of the things that helped me as a coach was... I had a long playing career and therefore it helps me have empathy for the players because I know how hard the game is. My gosh, it's a hard game, Passo. And um, you know, I started it as a young guy when I was 22 playing for Australia. I played five test matches. Um, it was like the dream. I got the baggy green cap and then all of a sudden, a few months later, it's take I got dropped for the 93 Ashes tour. And at the time, it was the end of the world. I could not see past the end of my nose. I was completely shattered. You know, I had the dream and the dream was gone. Um, but I had to work really hard to get it back. And I learned great lessons then. I great, learned great lessons from being dropped. I learned great lessons from some of the players I played with, Alan Border and David Boone and Steve Waugh. Um, you know, the list goes on. Um, so from playing, getting dropped, to fighting my way back in, then getting dropped again in 2001 during the 2001 Ashes series, to then coming back as an opening batsman at the end of that series, um, it was an extraordinary time. It was a, certainly a roller coaster journey, but I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, I had great friends. I met great friends. Um, they're like my brothers, the guys I played cricket in Australia with. They're literally like my brothers. I had great memories from winning. Uh, I played in two, two teams that won 16 straight test matches. I mean, <laughs> one thing I've learned, it's much more fun winning than losing. Doesn't matter who you play for, winning's more fun than losing. So, and I was lucky to do a lot of winning with some of the teams I played with with Australia. I mean, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal side that you were involved in um, around the sort of uh, late nineties, early early two thousands. Um, as you say, you went through some some extraordinary runs of victories in Test cricket, numerous Ashes victories. Um, was there any special ones in particular that uh, that stand out for you, or is any Ashes victory a special one? Yeah, I think all Ashes. I, I would say there was two big highlights for me in my main highlights. One was beating India in India in 2004. Australia's, I think we've only beaten India in India once in our history. So we got so close in 2001. We'd won 16 straight test matches. We had Sachin Tendulkar out on the end of day three, having made India follow on. And then BBS Laxman and Dravid batted all day. On day four, then we ended up getting bowled out in about four hours in that last day. So we got so close in 2001 and then to, to finally win there in 2004, that was the Mount Everest moment of my career. But then, of course, 
We got beaten by England in 2005. What a series that was. And then we ended up, my last test match was at the SCG. I retired with Shane Warne and Glenn McGrath. And I was batting with Maddie Hayden at the time. We hit the winning runs and we ended up winning 5-0. So that was certainly a great memory. As much because we'd been beaten by a very good team in 2005 by England. So the way we fought back on both those occasions was probably the, you know, the two great memories of my career. I mean, 2005 is a good series for us to talk about because it's probably the only one we've won when you were playing against us. But it, they've just been showing it on the, the, the replays on, on Sky over here at the moment. And it was an extraordinary series. With, uh, it almost stopped the nation some of the, some of the last day, days of the matches. Yeah, and Australia as well. I mean, it was amazing. And what was, what was most incredible about it is when we got home, everyone got, oh, that was so good. It was amazing cricket. I said, yeah, we got beaten. Yeah, but, you know, you finally got some competition. We're watching a competition. And I think that's what crowds actually like. We're very tribal, aren't we? But we like to see our team win. But you'd like a competition. And England certainly gave it to us in 2005. And I've got no doubt, knowing all my English friends over there, you're watching in this isolation period, you're watching the 2005 Ashes. And you'd be watching Ben Stokes' innings over and over and over again so you can gloat about beating the Aussies. So... You know, I love I love my English friends, but I also know how you operate. And we're no different in Australia, to be fair. But I reckon you'd be having reruns of 2005 Ashes and Ben Stokes 100 if I was a betting man. You've got it spot on, mate. Any time any time of the day, it's on somewhere. And 81. 81 Ashes when both of them went mad. I reckon it's just yeah. a, it's on repeat on all, the, on all the Sky channels over there, I would have thought. You've got it, mate. You've got it. You, you, you mentioned Matty Hayden. Obviously, you, you, you struck up a huge not only friendship, but, but professional sort of friendship with him as well in terms of what you achieved as, a, as an opening partnership when you got, got to open with him later, later on in your career. Yeah, it was so. I mean, when I got... Um, Steve War rang me the night before that fifth test at the Oval in 2001, and he said, oh, we've decided you're going to open the batting tomorrow. I said, oh, I haven't opened the batting in my life. And, he go, and I said, and, and I'm batting worse than anyone, I'm batting worse than Andy Caddick. It's impossible for me to be open. The bag goes, no, I think you'd be a good opener. And I, I was honestly in the worst form of my life. And but the very fact I could walk out with Haydos, I got great strength from that. And it's like it's like batting with Russell Crowe in the Gladiator. You know, Haydos walks out, he thinks he's Russell Crowe in the Gladiator. I swear to God. And uh, I took some confidence from that, and I got really lucky. I mean, I I still remember I. I got caught by Mark Grant for cash off Caddy's bowling for seven, but Caddy bowled a no ball. And from there, I ended up getting a hundred in that first test. Um, and then Caddy knocked me out. I got, had to retire. <laughs> but and I'll, I'll never forget Paso because I went up there in the oval, I got a hundred and then Caddy hit me in the helmet and probably sledged me like no one. Caddy was without doubt my top three most hated opponents. Cause you and I both know, no one talked more rubbish than Andy Caddick <laughs> to the And I was on the end of that a lot. Um, but he also became one of my favourite teammates when I played at Somerset. I mean, he became vice-captain my first year as captain. I love Caddy. I hated him as an opponent. What a knock. He was the first-class knock of the highest order. Anyway, I get knocked out. Caddy's hit me in the head. I got 100. And we went up into the change room and we're up there. And I'm lying there. I'm just about to go and have a brain scan. And... The team manager rings my mum and dad in Australia and they and you know, because they're watching it on telly, they're panicking. And my mum goes, Oh, are you all right, darling? I go, Am well, I all right? I had blood pouring out of my ear. I thought <laughs> I broke my jaw. I had, had a bleed on my brain. And I'm going, Are you joking, mum? Am I all right? I've just got a hundred on back. <laughs> I'm back, mum. Don't worry about the kit in the head. I'll be fine. I've been hit in the head plenty of times. I said, don't worry, mate. And my mum, oh, it was so cool. And yeah, and, and I knew. I'd been retired, hurt, thanks to Caddy. But I got 100, and that's when I started my partnership with Haydos, who, as you say, is one of my brothers and one of my great friends. You still keep in touch with him now? You're, you're still still good friends? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I'm doing a podcast with him tomorrow morning. He's finding yeah. stuff. And uh, we, did a, we had some terrible bushfires here in Australia in the summertime and we we did a we put on a bushfire appeal game and it was like one of the best days of my life all my brothers all back together i walked out the bat with hados again and was a and 
Courtney Walsh and Brian Lara and Satcham were all there. I mean, was a Matt Cram and Courtney Walsh and probably Andy Flintoff, to be fair, were the three hardest bowls I ever faced in my life. And I was actually there having a beer with them. They looked much better at their age with a beer in their hand than it was facing them in a game. I just made that was a Having them in that environment, having all those guys, Ricky Ponting and um, you know Andy si Andrew Simons and all those old mates of mine, it was just brilliant. And as I said, yeah, we catch up regularly, we speak regularly, and they are, I'm so close to them. And it's one of the highlights of my career having such great friendships with them, as I've got with some of my, my mates from Somerset. Yeah, so so moving on to, to your time with us, you'd obviously had three or four years with Middlesex uh, a few years earlier. You probably played against us a, a number of times. Some sometimes we'd have we'd have played okay, and you played against some pretty ordinary Somerset sides, I guess, around that time. What what was it made you came come to us at, uh, in two thousand and six? Well, it's so funny because talking about Caddy, you would have been playing Passo. Right? My first game at Lords for Middlesex, right? He got me out in the first innings. The ball came back down the hill and I got bowled. I can't remember. Anyway, the second innings, I'm batting up. I face middle six for Somerset. It was bloody gold. I ended up getting 200. And in my first game for Somerset, I got 200 and something. And Caddy's going, you are the worst overseas player that's ever played for middle six. It is embarrassing. I can't believe that they would select you. You are no good. I can't believe they've even thought about you as the OC. And I just kept, he kept bowling short. I kept smacking him further and further in the stands. I go, shove that up, <laughs> get stuff. I don't care what you say. <laughs> and that's where my love-hate relationship started with Caddy back in 97. I mean, like I say, first-class idiot when you play as an opposition. <laughs> that's what I remembered. And then um, come in a Somerset, it's a good story because I, in my 100th test match, I got knocked out. First ball of the game, I got knocked out by Natini. That's right, yeah. I was tossing up whether to retire or not. And my old batting coach, I got back to Perth after that series and it was like the old boxing trainer throwing in the towel. He goes, it's time to retire, mate. It is time to retire. I don't want to see you get hurt like this anymore. And I said, I appreciate what you're saying, Noddy, but we promise we're going to win back the Ashes before we retire. And I'll never forget, it was like that Rocky, Rocky Balboa movie, like the music come on in the car and he goes, righto, well, if you're not retiring, we've got some hard work to do. And oh, Paso, we got into the nets and it was horrible. I was on the bowling machine, I was ducking and weaving, I was playing pull shots, trying to get the confidence. Guys, you know, when you get hit as badly as I got, it's really hard to get over psychologically, right? And I've been doing this for about three months in the winter. And then uh, Brian Rose rang me up out of the blue and he said oh jay oh, i just wonder if you'd like to come and play for um i think um dan cullen the that's right off spinner he was going home so they need a replacement player and rosie rang he goes oh i need you to come over and uh you know you were going to play mostly t20 cricket and two first class games and i said well, you want me to play t20 cricket I said, are you sure you haven't got me mixed up, mixed up with Jai Saria or Chris <laughs> Gale or something? He goes, no, no, we want you to come and play T. I nearly fell off my seat. I said, yeah, okay, no worries. And all I was doing, because I've been doing all this horrible stuff with the short pitch bowling back here to get used to, I said, yeah, I'll get back and start playing some cricket. And, mate, what an experience. Um, I played some T20 cricket. We had a great year. Um, and then I played that last game at... Uh, Guildford, I got 300 leading up to the Ashes, so <laughs> I was pumped. I thought I was just doing it um, to get ready for the Ashes, which I did. And then, uh, the, as they say, the rest is history. And that, I think, didn't you then get a, a 300 on your first trip back in 2007 as well? Well, you know the folklore story. This is, and I'll share it with you guys. We played that game at Guildford, and the first time I met Andy Hurry, we sat there and I arrived and uh, we sat down in the old um, bar, the bar there and he goes, you feel like a brew? I go, yeah, I'm a brew. And I sat there with a coffee and you know what Sarge is like, his eyes did not leave my eyes for about an hour and a half. We had about three coffees together. And we've, since then we've probably had 3,000 coffees together. But he just kept staring me in the face. I'm going, jeez, this guy's serious. <laughs> He told me his story about being in the Royal Marines and I'm going, mate, this guy is serious. Anyway, after a few weeks of playing, he said, um, oh, will you think about coming back next year? I go, oh, no, mate, I think I'll probably play the Ashes and I'll retire. 
He goes, oh, yeah, it'd be great. You know, maybe come back and maybe be captain next year. I'm going, Sarge, like, seriously, mate, I am retiring and I'm going out to pasture. Da, da, da. Anyway, kept going on, come back next year, come back next year. I'm going, Sarge, I'm going to retire, mate. Relax, relax. Anyway, we're at Guildford. And what a lot of people don't know this story, but I'm about to tell you. We're at Guildford and I just scored 300, right? And I'm standing there and I'm standing at first slip and I had this stalker this English stalker, right? And what had happened a few years before on the 97 Ashes Tour, I wasn't playing and, I, and we were playing at Leeds and I was running laps and doing some boxing with a trainer, running laps, doing some boxing. And this bloke in the crowd, he was drinking um, pints of beer with his mates as you pommy blokes love to do and then abuse everyone. Anyway, and he's going, hey, Langer, you're, you're rubbish, you're rubbish. I'm going, I sort of smiled, did a bit more, bit, a bit more boxing ran some laps, did some more boxing, and he just kept going on and on. And then I just snapped, and I ran from one side of the goalpost with, the, with our trainer, and I sprinted, and this guy, and my, our trainer's running after me. I said, you're a coward. Come down here and say it to me, you bloody coward. You are weak. Just come and tell me to my face. He's going, oh, don't be so serious. Don't you don't get the English humour. I don't care about the English You come down here, you know. <laughs> And, I, and, I, and our trainer's grabbing me. It was like a, it was going to be a full-on brawl with 20 of his mates. Anyway, that's what happened in 97, right? And from that day, this guy kept turning up. He, every, every ashes, he'd turn up behind the nets. He'd go, the coward's back. <laughs> oh, no. He turned up in Australia. The coward's back. And I'm going, what? And then he set up this Facebook page. And he'd use... He, he was, with using my alias and he'd be abusing people and and we were trying we didn't know what to do trying to get the police involved and the coward and the coward kept doing it so i keep fast forwarding we're at guildford i get 300 i'm feeling pretty relaxed with the world we're feeling i'm feeling at first slip and guess who turns up the stalker turns up with his mates about four of his mates and he brought out the seven dwarfs and he put them down the seven little statues <laughs> And he's standing there and his mates, and they're just abusing me, abusing me. The coward's back and he's just abusing me, abusing me. I go, oh. But I didn't care because I was going back to Australia three days later. Anyway, this is what happens next, Passo. It's, it is gold. Darren Vaness. You know Daz? <laughs> the old bodybuilder, worked on the doors for years up north and tough as you come, mate. Nicest bloke, but tough. And then Sarge, the Royal Marine, and they start walking around the ground and they start walking, walking, and all the boys now are going, oh, this is going to be interesting. What's going to happen here? Because they're abusing their little Aussie mate. Anyway, and they sit behind these guys in the temporary stand and they sat there with their arms folded for about 20 minutes. And we're all watching between balls going, what is going to happen next? You know, next thing you know, Sarge, walks down puts his arm around my stalker and whispers in his ear and it wasn't for 10 seconds he whispered in his ear for about two minutes mate right next thing you know the stalker and his four mates pick up the seven dwarfs pick up the bag i've never seen him ever since i've never ever seen him since that day passo <laughs> i've never seen this guy ever ever again anyway we get on the bus that night and I say to Sarge, what did you say to me? He goes, I can't remember, mate. I said, all right. I said, where's the contract for next year? I'll sign it right now. And he goes, what are you talking about? He goes, what about Sue and the girls? I said, don't worry about Sue and the girls. I'll look after that. I'll sign the contract for next year right now. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, if you and Daz are going to have my back like that and show me that loyalty and sort it out, you got me for life. And then I ended up having three years. And people don't know that's why I came back to Somerset. Because of Darren, Vanessa and Sarge, who had my back and they looked after me and loyalty is my number one. And they looked after me. And then I had three amazing years at Somerset. And those got two guys to this day are two of my great friends. I mean, you know, Sarge is, is still doing a fantastic job as director of cricket at, at our place now. And, um, you know, he's well respected throughout, throughout the game. And, you know, I don't think there's ever been a bad word against him. Legend. Well, how honest is he? Mate, it's scary how honest. I just did a podcast before we spoke, Pastor, and we're talking about, I said, what, they said, what are the le three lessons you learned from Somerset? And I said, well, the number one lesson is if everyone's going in the same direction, you can 
produce miracles. I mean, remember that time, that first year I came, I think we had um, we had the chairman who was very ambitious, Giles Clark, very ambitious, and he wanted to see Somerset do well. And we had uh, Richard Gould, mate, what a ripping bloke as the CEO. I mean, he was ambitious. Then we had Rosie who was so passionate about Somerset cricket. We had, um, of course, Andy Hurry. And then we had, um, you know, Trez and Caddy were the two, two of the senior players. And we all, you know, we had some great players around us. We had great, and we're all going the same direction. And that's so powerful in leadership. When everyone's going in the same direction, we had that. So that's the number one lesson. And the second thing I learned was about honesty and Sarge, my gosh. There'd be times when, and you have been on the end of it, Pastor, I've been on the end of it. And you feel like saying, Sarge, be a little bit diplomatic. <laughs> He was so honest, mate. He was just yeah, so anyone who left his room, you could never, you had never had any doubt where you stood. And there, you know, the, the foundations of some of my leadership as a as now as the coach of Australia, loyalty and honesty. honesty. And I learned that from Sarge, and I learned the power of everyone going the same direction. You know, they had great lessons from Somerset at that time and from Sarge. And it's, it certainly turned turned the performances around as well. I mean. We were pretty low in 2006, championship-wise. I think we might even have been bottom of Div 2 for most of the year. Um, quickly turned that round to promotion. And then within within sort of halfway through the, the next season, I think we were top going clear. And hopefully, well, we didn't quite make it make it over the line. But having having Marcus and Caddy around was probably a big plus as well. But there were some, some decent cricketers around at that stage. And um, with opportunity, they sort of started to flourish, some of the youngsters. Yeah, there's some really good young players and they had some great senior players. What I've got at the moment in uh, the Australian cricket team is Steve Smith and Manus Lavashane. Like the best thing you can do as a coach or a leader is you can have that sort of mentor, master apprentice set up or big brother, little brother, call it what you like. And we had that at Somerset. I mean, we had some fantastic young bowlers who could watch Caddy go about or Shah Willoughby go about their business every day. You know, we had, we had some good young players. Peter Trigo, he could look, watch how you go about your business as an all-rounder pastor. It's hard work, right? We had some really good batters. We had Trez. Um, we had myself. We had some senior players. And then we had guys like Neil Edwards. And we had Errol Sapaya. We had James Hildreth, who could watch how guys have been playing a lot of it go about their business on and off the cricket field. So, you know, it was really, it was a, a powerful setup. And, um, you know, again, it was another great example. You have the senior players with the best young kids and, you know, you have the sustained success that way. And you, we've seen that in Somerset for a long time. And I think someone you haven't mentioned, but was, was coming through at that stage, Craig, Craig Kiesvetter was obviously sort of bursting on the scene. And then unfortunately it didn't go right for him with his, with his eye problems. But um, he, was, he was an extraordinary talent, wasn't he? Oh yeah, what a talent he was. I mean, he was a fantastic player, a very good wicket keeper. I mean, he was d destructive. He played, he you know, played for England as a result of that. I mean, he was a he was a gun player. Um, again, a young player who needed a clip every now and then, needed a bit of a smack on the backside every now and then. Um, but that's leadership as well. I mean, you've got to give them plenty of love, but you also give them a clip when they probably their behaviours aren't up to the standard that you're trying to achieve in the club or the team. So. But yeah, fantastic player. Uh, Hildy's been around a long time now. You know, the little prince. I mean, well, he was a terrific young player. Errol Sapaya, you know, all those guys are fantastic cricketers. Um, and probably Craig was probably the emergence of, what, of almost a T20 specialist. Um, you spoke briefly about the, the T20 and, and what a change it was for you coming with a bit of freedom and just playing in a, in a free way in a T20. But it, the, the T20 sort of taken over a, and, and people are now just going around the, around the world playing T20 in certain competitions. Do you think that's a good thing? Yeah, there's some players who do that, but I, I still believe, Pastor, the best players can play all three forms of the game. And most and most of the successful ones get their big breaks and make the big money in T20 if they're playing great international cricket. You think about, uh, you know, the list goes on, whether it's now A.B. de Villiers or Chris Gale or... Um, Shane Watson, they were, they were fantastic international players and they've had longevity in the game. I also know a lot of players who thought it sounds like a good idea to just be a T20 specialist and their careers aren't very, um, they're pretty short-lived. So 
Um, the best players can play all three forms of the game, I think. And there's certainly some um, the real opportunities in for T. I remember Sachin Tendulkar saying it, T20 is a bit like the dessert. You know, it's, uh, it tastes good and it makes you fat, but you can't live without the, the um, entree and the main meal. You can't meet, live without the meat and veggies, which is one day cricket and test cricket, if you're going to become a really, really good player. So you've got you've got to get your basis in 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 order first before you can start being too expansive in a T20. Is that is that where you're going? Oh no doubt. And, and look, one fact of life, whether you're playing Test cricket or T20 cricket, and it's a fact of life I know too well, is you can't make runs from the change room. Definitely. So it doesn't matter at T20, you can play all fancy shots, but you can't make any runs if you're not in the middle. So you've still got to have a game where you can stay in the middle, and that's where cricket smarts come in. We have seen a. You know, there's different shots played. Um, but I'd, I'd say that um, WG, Grace, or Sir Donald Bradman, if they played in this era, they would have learned, the great players learn how to adapt and to change their game. So, yeah, we see some adaption. I love T20 cricket, um, but equally I love Test cricket. The great test still is Test cricket. And if you ask most players to this day um, what they would love to be remembered as, and most of them are remembered as great Test players, there's... T20 players, some, you know, they'll become very rich, but doesn't necessarily they're going to be remembered as great players, where the great players will be remembered generally um, as those who have been great test players who then go on to play great T20 cricket. I think of Virat Kohli, I think of A.B. de Villiers, um, I think of uh, you know, Ben Stokes could play all games, Joss Butler could play all games. I mean, they're the great players who um, will be remembered. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you look back, we talked about the, the, the Ashes series of, of years ago, and it, it's very difficult to remember a T20 match of, of 10, 15 years ago, whereas I think most people can, can recall, because it takes so much longer, five days, it's over five, five matches of five days, and people tend to, to remember it a little bit more as, a, as, as achievements, if you like. Yeah, and I think in the thing about what we're great at, and you're probably hearing a bit here in this interview, but we become great at telling stories because you've got time to think about the stories and the, the game evolves. You got, well, that's one of the great things about cricket, actually. We've, it's, not, it's a strength, not a weakness. We actually have five-day cricket. We have four-day cricket. We have 100-over cricket. In England, you have 40-over cricket. And now you have T20 cricket. And now you're having this thing, or you might have this thing called 100 cricket. And I think now they're playing 10-over cricket. So, you know, it, it's a game for all different personalities. It's a game for all different skills. It's a game for all different athletes. And that's why I love the game so much, because it caters for so many people on and off the field, players and supporters. So we, we, obviously your passion for cricket hasn't, hasn't dwindled at all, mate. You can see that uh, you know, your enthusiasm is, and, and, and Australia cricket is obviously in a better place with you now, now as, as head coach. What's the plans now? You've you got uh, obviously Ashes coming up next winter for us. Um, what's, what's the touring situation at the moment? Well, in terms of the passion, this is a true story, Pass. So when I was 17 years old, so that was in 1987, my family, the whole extent of that, wrote a time capsule that we're going to open in the year 2000, so 13 years later. And I wrote a letter, which is still sitting in my study now, and the letter said along the lines of, I was 17, so I don't know, who knows, but I said... Um, I'm at the crossroads of my life right now. I'm not really sure what to do. Should I study or should I, yeah, I'd love to play cricket. And then I wrote these lines. Imagine if someone could give me a contract right now where I, I knew I could play cricket for Australia and be involved in Australian cricket for the rest of my life. <laughs> like I said that as a 17 year old, I'm 50 now and I'm still doing it. So I love the game. I love the game. Um, What's going to happen? Well, you know, there's talk now if the West Indies, the tour of the West Indies works um, in England, uh, we're supposed to be there next month, but that's obviously not going to happen. But, you know, if you had asked me two weeks ago, when we come to England in September, I would have thought there was no chance, but who knows? We might be in England as, as incredibly important as it is for India to come to Australia next year to keep us um, economically viable. I'm sure it's important that Australia comes to England and um, plays some cricket for the media rights and for, you know, for the health of the game, I think. So that might happen. And then obviously we were supposed to have the World Cup 
T20 World Cup in Australia, that's going to be challenged. Hopefully a decision is made on that soon, one way or the other. Um, and then India come out here, and, and India and Australia now is a huge contest. So hopefully that happens, one for the fans, one for the, as I said, for the economic viability of the game. And then, of course, the Ashes next summer in Australia. And we, you know, we all know everyone loves Ashes cricket, um, and we'll all be looking forward to that. Brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much for your time. We'll have to call it short there, I think, uh, JL. Brilliant, brilliant to have a chat with you, mate, and uh, to see, see you going so well over there in Australia. Wish you all the best in the coming series and everything apart from the, the England games. And um, obviously, we'll be look forward to catching up if, uh, if you're over here in England soon as. But um, from all at Somerset, mate, stay safe and uh, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks, Pass. I've got so many. I've said to you before we started this, my wife would come back tomorrow. We've got such great memories of Somerset. I've got such great friends there. And uh, yeah, I always get down there. So thanks for the memories. Thanks for the friendships. And uh, look, every time I'm in England, I will definitely be a Somerset. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys. Hope everyone's well.